Good afternoon and um, for some good evening. Um, I know we have an international audience joining us today. Um, so I'll, st I'll get started. I know we have our participants still joining in, um, but let's get started with our topic today. Uh, for those who are new or for those who have been here um, for many, many sessions already, um, my name is Dr. Lisa Wisniewski. I am in, an associate professor of sociology at Goodwin University, and I also serve as the moderator of our community conversations. Um, so today I'm very excited um, that our topic of community conversations is around social capital and immigrant communities. Um, and we have a speaker here from the University of New Haven. So I will introduce our speaker, and then she will share a little lecture around social capital. And after her lecture, we have a few discussion discussion questions that frame our conversation around this topic um, that we'll have a conversation around. If you have any questions for the speaker, um, I will reserve time at the end at around uh, 1.20 p.m. U.S. time um, for questions, or if you have something you want to contribute to our conversation, please feel free to type it in the chat. I do monitor the chat and we'll ask um, our speaker and in engage in the conversation, all right? So if you have any questions, happy to answer them in the chat, but let's get started with our conversation. And I would like to introduce to you, um, Angela Caracristos. And, you know, Angela's here from the University of New Haven, and I wanna share her bio uh, with uh, our audience today. So. Angela, after more than a decade as an HR leader in People's United Bank, Angela Caracristos has brought her experiences to higher ed, where she is a talent acquisition manager at the University of New Haven. Angela has deep expertise in learning and development, performance management, and organizational development. Together with her personal experience as a first-generation college student and professional, she is committed to educating and advocating for the advancement of women, mothers, and first gens in the workplace. When she is not at the University of New Haven, she is coaching and consulting women in leadership and those who are making a career transition. By drawing on her experiences in corporate HR and master's degree in industrial and organizational psychology, she works with individuals looking to better navigate their careers and become effective leaders. She is currently working on launching her website, Career Moves for Women, where she will be providing women with tools and resources to su succeed at work. Angela, thank you so much for joining us here today in our conversation. Thank you, Dr. Wisniewski. It's my pleasure to be here, especially to talk about this topic in particular. Um, it's something that is very near and dear to my heart as a member of the Greek American community coming from immigrant, uh, an immigrant community. Uh, I think that this, this conversation is so relevant right now and also really important. So I appreciate you inviting me to come here. Absolutely. So thank you for joining us. Um, as I mentioned, we, we have a quick lecture that you'll be sharing with us about what is social capital? What is this, you know, you know what, we're going to explore what is social capital and I, how does this relate um, to immigrant communities? So we'll bring up the PowerPoint and we'll go through our lecture first and then move to our discussion questions. Thank you. Yep. So today's community conversation is about social capital and immigrant communities. And I think that I hope that the takeaway at the end of all this is that immigrant communities actually have a lot more social capital than I think they sometimes uh, believe. And mm -hmm. it took me a long time to realize the amount of social capital and the skill set that I built uh, within my community, my small community, um, that has helped me throughout my career. And so today's lecture uh, and talk is really going to be about how do we take what we learn in our small immigrant communities, whether it's us, those of us who are experience it and grow up in these communities or as faculty um, and staff who work with students who are coming from these communities to help them bring those that skill set that they have naturally built, navigating those connections uh, to the workplace and to school. So if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so I thought I would share some photos of where my social capital was built within my, my immigrant community. I was born and raised in New London, Connecticut. Um, actually, if we have a guest, I think from London, this is the new London uh, that I'm talking about here in Connecticut. And we had a relatively a decent sized Greek 
community in New London. There are some um, centers within Connecticut that some of you might be aware of, right? Bridgeport, New Haven, Hartford um, have big Greek churches that have become sort of the epicenter of Greek or Greek culture and the way that our communities um, kept the culture alive as they immigrated here. And we can talk a little bit more about that as I get into my talk. Um, my father immigrated from Greece in 1970, which is um, important to note because prior to 1965, our immigration laws for Southern Europeans um, were pretty restrictive. And it wasn't until the Brothers and Sisters Act of 1965 where our immigration laws allowed um, family reunification and um, whole families were able to come to this country. And we saw an influx of Greek Amer Greeks coming from Greece to the United States to work in um, mills and factories. And uh, of course, they created their own niche economy, uh, which many of you are probably familiar with, the Greek diner and Greek pizza restaurants. And so if you've ever uh, gone to a Greek diner or restaurant, you, or <laughs> went to a pizzeria and then realized it's probably Greek owners. Uh, this is because it became our niche economy and a way that we actually built our social capital in the greater, you know, American community. Um, currently, I uh, am working human resources for the University of New Haven, uh, doing talent acquisition, uh, which is important to me because, especially in the current climate of making sure that our hiring and recruiting practices are inclusive and that focused on diversity, inclusion, access, and belonging. Um, I think having grown up in an immigrant community, whether that be Greek or Latin American or Polish or whatever that might be, Italian, I think um, it's, it's helped me personally understand how bias plays a role in the way that um, we hire and select candidates and how we need to do better and ways that we can do better when it comes to making sure that our hiring processes and our um, succession plans and the way that we promote people are fair. And also seeing the skill set, and I want to talk about that today too, seeing the skill set that the candidates who come from these communities bring because they have naturally been brought up in, in communities where um, they've had to build their social skills, they've had to build their cultural competence um, and are actually very well equipped to be successful in the workplace. And so my commitment to advocating for and really improving career outcomes for first-gen students um, and first generation professionals really comes from a personal place and one that started right here in these photos. So I just, just to give you some background and context, that's me uh, on the left <laughs> uh, during a Greek Independence Day um, presentation that we would do at our church. Uh, and then on the right hand photo, as I got older, I was very involved. We had a uh, Greek traditional dance troupe and we would travel around to other churches and Greek festivals and perform. And this is really, you know, an integral part of how our community has tried to keep our culture alive in the United States after immigrating here, right? So it was really about bringing their kids in, um, bringing them to Greek school where they learned the language and there's really a strong tie between, for the Greek community anyway, preserving the language uh, and its connection to preserving the culture. And so there, you know, many parents felt like once you lose the language, you lose the culture. So um, it was a priority for a lot of Greek families to have a Greek school available, um, which also did a lot of other cultural education like dance and history and geography and all of that. So um, this was my start in really, you know, when I was invited to talk about social capital and I had to think about it in the context of an immigrant community, this is really where it all began, right? At church. And um, which is interesting because when immigrants came and had no real connections and no network, they had to find a place to congregate uh, because the only other connections they had were people from their country that they were that they knew, or at least they could communicate with. And for us here in the United States, the immigrants that came here from Greece, that became the church. And so then it started to build this very strong connection between the religion and 
church and also preserving the culture here um, as immigrants. So the church became more than just a church. It became a cultural center and a community center. So you'll see like in the picture, that's our community center that was attached to the church where we held all kinds of events um, and cultural events, Greek dances, Greek um, presentations and um, most of you are probably familiar with the Greek festivals, right? So uh, another way and tool that our communities used to build that social capital in the greater um, community that they worked and lived, right? So um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so what is social capital? Just to give sort of a quick uh, overview. It's an individual's relationships and networks um, and the benefits that those relationships can provide. And so when we talk about, as an HR person, right, I'll, just to give you some context as to where my career has come, how it's sort of come full circle here. Um, I started out working in my parents' pizzeria. <laughs> and that was my first job, uh, working in the restaurant. And uh, I thought I was going to be a teacher decided that I, I didn't want to teach right out of college. And so my first professional job after the restaurant was as a teller at a bank. As I was working in the bank and once I got my, my bachelor's degree, I was able to go into the management training program and manage a branch. Um, and throughout that program, I realized the importance of, you know, how, what went into managing people, which was a lot of um, developing and teaching and training um, your employees to be effective. And I had learned the fundamentals of that at the restaurant with my parents. <laughs> so when a, uh, opportunity came up to move into the training department, right, of the bank, which I didn't even think was a job that existed, right, training adults how to do their job, um, because in our immigrant community, it was like you became a doctor, lawyer, or engineer. That those were the top three because parents wanted to build, right? They want their kids to succeed. Uh, I transitioned into learning and development for the the bank and found that found this world of human resources. And if I reflect on it now, I've been uh, a human resource manager since I was 15, working at the pizzeria, and all the skills that I learned as a child of an immigrant family running a business. Um, so in retrospect, and how that relates to what we're going to talk about today, I think there's a lot of immigrant um, young people, or um, excuse me, young people who are children of immigrants or come from these communities who are working in their family businesses or participating in their communities uh, by way of cultural groups, dance troops, Greek school, you know, uh, Hebrew school, whatever that might be, right? And they're building all of these skills that are very transferable to the professional world, um, but they don't realize it. They, they don't realize that those skills and those connections are very valuable, both at the university level when they're studying and also when they get out into the professional world. And so, um, when I see a resume come through um, and I see, and I sort of pick up that the student worked at a family business, like I had a, a young Indian American student who worked at their, his family's liquor store. He felt like he had no skills because he worked at a package store. Um, and I said to him, you have so many skills. You help run a business because your parents are relying on you. Um, to run this business and you probably interact with customers and you probably know everyone in that neighborhood. And so you have this skill set to be able to build social capital for yourself and network that um, has, you know, for whatever reason, either it hasn't been valued or you haven't realized the value um, that you can take to the workplace. And so that's why um, social capital is so important to these students and the students that you all serve um, at Goodwin. Uh, also for those of us who come from these communities to realize like we actually have built up some amazing skills. So if you could go to the next slide, please, Carrie. Um, there's two types, right, of networks that 
play into social capital. And I, I love this slide that Dr. Wisniewski had provided because I think that this is so true, right? We have the inherited network, which are the social, the social infrastructure that we're sort of born into, right? I was born into the Greek American community. My aunt lived up the street. We went to church. We knew other Greek families. We were connected to them either um, through uh, by marriage or by other connections, right? Participating in the church. And so this is was an, uh, my inherited network. Never in a million years did I think that this was actually a network. This was just the people we grew up around. Um, to me and to young people in our community, we never thought of perhaps using that network of people to help us get a job. <laughs> or to progress in some way professionally. These were just the folks we were surrounded by. And now that we're a couple generations in, right? Me, for example, as someone who came from that um, community, I'm part of the inherited network for the younger kids coming up in the Greek American community. Now I have a career that I've built in human resources, um, right? I. I've gotten my master's degree. I went to I went to college, and so now I hope my hope is that I'm part of that inherited network that can help the younger generation, right, um, progress and and achieve their career goals as well. So um, I think that's what's the beauty of this is that we need to start educating pe these young people who come from these communities about you have this inherited network, use it. Who's in it? Who, who can you connect with at your, at your church, in your community activities, at those festivals? What are ways that you can make those connections? And who, you know, who in that network can help you with your career aspirations? Um, that never occurred to me until now as an adult, right? <laughs> who looks back and says, hey, you know, um, that neighbor really helped me when I needed a job or a resource or, um, you know, when our restaurant, and it goes back to very simple things you learn as a kid, when we'd run out of, I don't know, something at the restaurant, my dad would call his other Greek friend who had a restaurant and say, hey, can I borrow 10 bags of French fries and I'll pay you back in gyro meat? Like, you know, like this was the sort of connections and things you learn that um, actually are very relatable to um, the, your professional life as you move into the corporate world. Um, but then there's also this web of support, right? And so that's where I feel like this, these conversations that we're having about um, the immigrant experience is that we, we have to realize, um, especially if we work in higher ed, we're also part of that web of support for students um, and young people coming from these immigrant communities who might be a first generation student or professional, right? And um, we might be outside of their inherited network, but we do have a role to play in supporting them. And they have to also realize and understand and identify the people in that web of support that can help them as well, right? So whether that's people in the career development center, people in um, financial, aid, <laughs> financial aid, faculty, um, those that web of support can be integral as being outside of that cultural immigrant community um, to help give them the lift um, and give them the advantages that they need to to be successful at school and in, in their professional life. Um, so um, so that's that's really kind of how I see coming from an immigrant community, right? There are certain things that we learn. Um, that we don't realize can be so important and so valuable to our careers. Um, and it's, it's all in the way that we use it and communicate to our young people about it, right? And so just to drill, just to connect it back to my experience as a Greek American, okay? Um, I was sharing earlier that I had to pull out, this is my honors thesis that I wrote back in 2002 as a senior history major. Um, and it's about the language and religion of second generation Greek Americans at St. Sophia Greek Orthodox Church in New London, Connecticut. And the basis of my thesis was that we're not really Greek, Greek we don't, we're not Greek and we're not American. We've sort of created our own culture and mm -hmm. our own language and our own way to 
bring our cultural values um, into our lives as we navigate life in the United States, right? And, and really build this bridge. But fundamentally, those values, right, that we learned in our community, and maybe you've heard of, of, of some of these, um, things like filotimo, which means love of honor. Um, there's really no American, uh, English definition for it, but love of honor, doing what is right, the sense of duty, um, this uh, idea of loyalty and this loyalty to our parents and this feeling that we have to do well in our lives in order for us to pay them back for all their hard work, right? And then this, this uh, whole idea of collectivism that we're raised in, um, these communities where we all help each other out because we're all here trying to make it work, right? Those three things, um, and those are just three that I picked, uh, can work for us in two ways. One, they make us great employees, right? We do what's right. We're very loyal and we know that we have to do good work for the collective, right? To, for the business to be successful for our customers. Um, so I see first gen students and first gen professionals many times rising as stars, right? And uh, it's because they've been brought up in these communities where you, you have these values, you wanna be successful, okay? Um, and part of that too is navigating social relationships and understanding how to present yourself, how to communicate, how, who's, who are the players in the room? Because our parents had to figure that out, right? And so we were figuring that all out um, as we were growing up. But those, those, three, those three or four values can also have some cons, right? And so as much as philotimo is a wonderful thing and it's inherent in our, our Greek culture to do what's right, and to have a sense of duty um, and doing what's honorable, um, right? That might translate into us having a hard time saying no and setting boundaries and, and doing going above and beyond um, too, too much and spreading ourselves thin, right? When it comes to loyalty, I know in my own career, right? I, loyalty is a, a valuable thing to me and important to me, but at the same time for some of our young people, right? That might mean that they may sacrifice themselves to stay loyal to an organization way longer than they should, right? Um, and, and commit themselves to organizations where maybe they are not as valued as they could be, right? And the, in terms of being part of a collective community, um, right? That could translate the con, the, the, the downside of that is that we may not be so great at advocating for ourselves. Right and um, tooting our own horn and marketing ourselves and talking about ourselves and our achievements, right? And so as part of the web of support or as part of the inherited network of young professionals and students, I would say to all of us, right? We have to really understand um, that these students and young professionals really come with a level of maturity and a level of skill in cultural competence and navigating the workplace that um, we should appreciate, but also be sensitive to how much pressure they're putting on themselves to, you know, do good work and be excellent employees. Um, so I'm going to leave it there because I really want us to have a conversation, Lisa, but um, just to kind of set the context of where I'm coming from with this whole topic. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope I didn't talk too much, but um, Euro and, and just for the next slide, if anybody wants to reach out to Angela, she's an amazing resource. Um, you know, these are the ways to, you could contact her and email or on uh, social media channels. Um, I would highly recommend connecting with Angela, even just for a lovely chat. I always enjoy my chats with Angela. So, so thank you um, for our overview of what is social capital and how does this relate to our communities? So let's get into our discussion questions. And I will say, I saw Michelle uh, wrote a thousand percent accurate in, in sort of the, uh, which you were talking about the different ways um, that we're great employees, um, 
and perhaps that could be a con. I, I, Michelle, I'm sorry I didn't catch exactly where uh, you put it, but I wanted to say Michelle highly uh, agreed with what you were saying. Um, so, you know, our discussion questions are really focused around um, the, pre the contents of your presentation. And so let's just jump right into them, especially focusing on inherited networks. So our, our first question is, how can these inherited networks of immigrant students influence the experiences that they have as students in higher education? Okay, so their, how can their experiences, excuse me, how can their inherited network influence their experience? Mm -hmm. As students in higher education. Yes, so um, I think especially, and I can talk about my personal experience, right? Mm -hmm. Having to have to go to Greek school, mm -hmm. having, which was a priority, right? Yeah. Or having to participate in cultural, uh, you know, things as a, as a kid growing up, um, whether we liked it or not, we had to go, right? <laughs> I think also instills in students um, who come from these communities a sense of diligence and discipline. Um, and again, right, that, that sense of, you know, I made a commitment to doing this, I have to do it. And that transfers to their experience as a college student when um, I know I, I have adjuncted in the past and taught classes and in some of the students that I've had that have always risen to the top or been the hardest working are the ones that come from communities or um, are first gen students that have participated in things like this, like I did as a kid and you're like, okay, I made this commitment, whether I like it or not, I have to. Um, so I think that's one way in which their inherited networks, right, this expectation that you know, you're a representative, you're a representative of our culture, of our community out in the world, okay? And we're giving you this love and this pride in where you're coming from. We expect you <laughs> to do something with this. Mm -hmm. That transfers. And so when they get to, to college, it's like, I, I have people who are really interested in my success. And I mean, what really, if you think about it, it's almost like, mentorship without one specific mentor right? mm -hmm. you you get these messages about expectations and what you could do what's possible what's out there why your parents wanted to come to the united states um, and what kind of opportunities they came here to have and so you're like okay i have work to do and i feel like um, these students you know but again they, they do great work, they're hard workers, but they can also put a lot of pressure on themselves. I, I will add here that I can certainly relate, especially to your comments about Greek school. We went to Polish school eight years in my life. Um, and I wasn't a great elementary school student. I was a little difficult. I learned 10, when I was 10, that was the turning point for me. So when I was a kid on Friday nights, I would say, mom, why do I have to go to Polish school? And then I'd hand her my homework to do it for me. Like, again, I was a terrible student at that point, right? But again, you know, I, my complaint was no other kid has to go to school six days a week. Right. And my mother's only response was, you'll thank me later one day. And, you know, what does a an eight-year-old accept with that answer, right? Um, but sort of, there's always this, um, how does this pressure or sort of this focus on education yeah. really starting early, you know, um, and having all those different ways. And so let me clarify what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Going to your American school or your English school five days a week, mm -hmm. your, I'll say Polish Saturday school. Mm -hmm. And to the point that you started your conversation about how churches are really a lot of the center of, or, or houses of worship are the center of many communities. On top of that, we had to go to religion class on Mondays. So, you know, my whole elementary experience was really focused on, they didn't give me a break, right? Um, so how early do we start sort of these conversations, right? But that can also, to what you said, lead to a pressure to perform. Mm -hmm. I'm the there's somebody watching me yeah you know I don't know if it was your experience but my experience certainly was uh we came to this country for you to get a college education like I didn't know there was an option like you didn't you couldn't go to college <laughs> that's an option right you know um so but that all of those things can lead to a pressure to perform I'm the only one I'm representing a whole community um and how does that um, 
help or hurt her progress. I don't know. I think I could see that going either way. Yeah. It's certainly a struggle, right? It's a struggle, especially as a young person growing up. I remember being, you know, in high school and college when you, and that's not to say there weren't Greek kids who rebelled. They certainly did. But, the, but my personal experience was, okay, I have to be, I have to do well. I have to be good. I have to do the right thing, right? Because my, I see, I work side by side with my parents at this restaurant. I see what they go through on a daily basis. I, I have to do right by them. Um, you know, and, and the way that to me, the, that social capital kind of played a role was that all of that was either to the end of either building the social capital for our family, right? So when we had the restaurant, our customers, not, again, not anything that I thought of at the time, but the customers that we knew and um, met on a daily basis, those, those were part of our network. We were building a network, right? Um, the Greek festivals that our churches hosted, that was a way for our community to build social capital within the towns that they were in. We met people, people met us, they knew us, they knew us through the restaurants. Uh, so yeah, it was like all eyes on us. Uh, we had to do the right thing. Which, which is interesting now that you said that I just had a thought, you know, based on our conversation. And I'm also going to um, give a quick shout out to Dr. John Kanya because he did one of our first lectures on the historical overview of immigration to New England. And a lot of the topics that he discussed, you're also kind of going back to, right, about, you know, the community center. So you're, you know, this is a great tie into our earlier lecture. Um, and if you did miss that one, we will have the recording up very soon. So I would recommend uh, watching it. Um, but one of the things being in the session Dr. Kanya did and now to what you just said. What's interesting is your community experience seems very community facing. You know, what you just got described having restaurants, having big festivals, right? There was a lot of interaction versus what's making me think growing up in the Polish community, many of my uh, relatives or colleagues in the Polish community worked in manufacturing or construction. So it's almost, we were not as front facing, right? You know, we didn't, you know, have sort of that much sort of interaction, if you will. Um, it's more focused on a particular job. And um, this is a thought perhaps for another session, but how does that influence the experiences of individuals within these communities is the work in which that they engage in and how do they make their networks, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm already planning a next webinar, my <laughs> based on what you just said. Um, so, um, but, you know, you made a great point too, Lisa, about going to Polish school and feeling like you were the only kid who had to go to school six days a week. And we felt the same. Had we known that Polish kids went to Polish school and Jewish kids went to Hebrew school and there was, you know, all of these other kids doing exactly what we were doing, I think we would have found some comfort in that, right? And um, <laughs> maybe we would have also rebelled against our parents on that one, you know, that would have been but that is very true, right? I didn't know that at the time when I was a child, I just thought this is what our community did, right? Um, you know, it would be nice to know that other kids, but then my argument would go with my mom. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> there was no winning the argument. It just would there was. There was no winning. That. It wasn't just Greek school that Greek kids had to go to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, Angela, I'm going to sort of move our conversation for a second because Ken actually has a question. One of our audience members has a question. Um, and his question is, how does one educate hiring authorities about social capital of young first gen candidates? Ooh, hiring authorities. So meaning people like myself who are working in, in HR, right? Um, so I think that gets to the bigger issue of making sure there are people like them in those jobs or in that role, right? And making sure that our HR departments are a reflection of society at large, which is largely made up of, right, immigrants and, and children of immigrants. So um, how do we educate them? Well, I, and, and I love this question because I think that we're not doing enough. I think that when we have discussions about um, diversity, equity, uh, access, and belonging, we, we have to also make sure that when we're talking about um, bias in the hiring process, that we have to also consider first gens as part of that group. And many students of color are also first generation college students, first generation professionals, and um, really making sure that our hiring processes are 
are fair are based in, and this is sort of the approach that I, I take in, in my role, right? Based in what are the um, bona fide occupational qualifications that we're hiring for, um, making sure that when we hear that a higher up's son or daughter is interested in a job, that they're not the only candidate that's considered, that we're also considering opening, casting a wide net and considering all candidates for certain positions. Um, so yes, I think there's a lot of work to be done in educating human resource professionals, but the bright side of that is human resource as a practice um, has become much more popular program I can I have seen at the University of New Haven and I'm I, and at Quinnipiac and I, I don't know about Goodwin but I think that students have an interest in understanding and really learning how to be how to how to effectively manage people and mm -hmm. how to be a good HR practitioner and a lot of the curriculums incorporate anti bias and um, designing interview questions and designing assessments and applications that can prevent some of that bias from creeping in. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hope I answered it, but. And smiled, so I'm gonna go with a yes on that Okay, one. thanks again. <laughs> I'm smiling, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that that means yes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of goes into our second question that we had for artists, oh, Ken says, thank you. Um, you know, as educators, you know, you just gave a great, you know, discussion about hiring practices, right, in, in HR, um, and you mentioned that a lot of programs are moving in this direction, and that's, that's wonderful. Um, so as educators, how can we work with students to further develop the networking skills that they have acquired in their communities? You know, you, you did uh, a great job of discussing the different ways that we have social capital and that we engage with others. How can we as educators take that like the next step further? How can we help them? I think there's two ways, right? Number one is to understand that as educators, we're part of that web of support, right? And so um, being clear with students that I'm part of your network now, mm. connect with me on LinkedIn, connect with me, right? I'm, I'm part of this professional network. Like, yes, I might be your professor today, but tomorrow I can write you a recommendation. I am happy to be a connection. I'm happy to be a mentor to you. Um, and some students, whether they feel intimidated by faculty sometimes or mm -hmm. staff or um, only see us in the capacity that we work at the university and don't see us as a, a professional connection, I think that could be very helpful to them to, to, to show them, to teach them and to educate them that everyone you're meeting now in college is going to be part of your network in the future. Um, your friends, right? Like my, there was three of us in my Greek school class. One of us became a pharmacist. The other one is a teacher and here I am in HR, right? But that's not, they're now part of my professional network. At the time we were three Greek kids at Greek school, right? And so you have to understand, they have to understand that when they're in college, yes, they have fun, they have friends, they have professors, but these people are going to become part of their social, their, their network as they become professionals because everyone's gonna move on, right? Um, and then the other way that we can help support them with their skills um, is to also help them make the connection between what they've learned in these cultural and experiences in their immigrant communities and how that translates and transfers to, prof to their professional mm -hmm. life. Because I don't think that they often see that connection, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, participating or being the leader of your dance troupe at your church um, gave you a lot of leadership skills that are also um, transferable to work. And so I think helping them make those connections between um, what they did in their community to what they can do at work. Mm -hmm. I and I'm again looking at Dr. John Kanyan because he's in front of me, but I'm just thinking about a, a curriculum and assessments that we could do. How can we do a reflective writing assignment? that makes them think about their experiences and how that connects to their future goals, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what is that autobiographical story and how does that make those connections um, further on? Um, yeah, I mean, working in the restaurant, I was managing, I didn't realize this at the time, right? 
but I, I got to see all kinds of HR issues that I still see on a daily basis now. And I didn't notice, I didn't realize at the time those were HR issues. It was like, we had a crazy waitress or someone didn't show up for work and I had to come and fill in this, the shift, right? Now I see it from a strategic perspective, a business perspective. It's totally transferable. I think that's a great idea, uh, Dr. Wisniewski. Yep. So, so we could design that in, into our curriculum, um, you know, as well. I, I, I go to writing just because of the nature of what I teach, but, um, you know, what are some ways that we can infuse this within the curriculum um, to that? But, I, and I want to return to your earlier point too, for a second, you know, I often make the argument as a faculty member that a professor is the most underutilized resource on a college campus, because I think oftentimes it's like the view of the hierarchy, right? And that we're just there to teach and leave versus, you know, we still have connections to our fields of study, right? We have connections to other professionals. And I always tell my students, I'm like, the best thing I can do is give you a job recommendation and you don't even know it. And I can do that when you tell me what your goals are, when you tell me what your direction is. And then when I hear about a job opportunity, because people come to me all the time and they're like, do you have a student who, you know, can do this, this, and this? And if oftentimes I have to say no, but if I know that's your goal, I'm so happy to make that connection and that recommendation. And oftentimes I don't think that connection is made in higher education. And, you know, to your point too, about, you know, the world is changing so fast. It used to be, you know, social media had these clear guidelines, right? You don't friend anybody from work. Those are your friends and everything else. Now these are networking tools. Yes. That, that sort of barrier is sort of broken a little bit. You know, obviously we can have personal and professional accounts and that's again, a whole different webinar on how to, um, you know, separate, differentiate sort of those two, but how can you use a tool like LinkedIn, you know, effectively mm -hmm. and share your professional experience? Um, whether, you know, I know you and I do this because I've seen both of us where you share our professional experiences on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And maybe we think we're sharing something that's just, not important, but maybe for somebody else that's going to show them a direction, right? Or see a resource. So how do we can, how can we also capitalize or utilize these tools effectively um, in mm -hmm. the professional networking, even with students? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. I think we could do better at um, educating them. I know LinkedIn, for example, that's a good example many students, younger students for as, you know, for as social media savvy as they are, don't use LinkedIn until they graduate or they're ready to graduate. They don't see it as a social media tool um, that they would engage in before they need a job. And um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to teach them how to use it better and how to start using it from their first day they step on campus as a freshman. Mm -hmm. uh, and start building up that network. They don't have to post anything, but just starting to connect with people on it and mm -hmm. where those connections might lead could be really important. Mm -hmm. And even just an awareness of what they're doing. I mean, I, I'm at this point where, you know, people will come up to me, I see them, you know, in real life and they mention something and I post on LinkedIn. And I have this moment of like, how did you know that? And before I get the question, I'm like, oh, LinkedIn. You know, don't don't ask the question. You know, um, how do we sort of create this awareness around that, and what are some of the tools that we can use? There are others. We're just sort of mentioning LinkedIn as one, but you know, these are great tools that we can help students um, in utilizing that they can network without leaving their homes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as we sort of wrap up our conversation, so I want to leave some time in case there are audience questions, um, and I think you you did touch upon this, but in case there's anything else you want to add. Um, so how do the cultural values of immigrant communities influence student experience in college and the workplace? So really we're looking at how do the values, which you know, you ended uh, your lecture on, how can they influence our experiences in college and also the workplace? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, you know, I did talk about how they can be amazing assets, but also can be our Achilles heel at times, um, navigating the workplace and, and navigating college life um, as someone who might be deeply connected to those values, right? Uh, but I think another way that I, I'm sort of thinking through right now as we're talking is how do we help students weave those values into 
um, for example, their resume or how they present themselves professionally, right? Um, I think part of my thesis is really funny was about how we were trying so hard to assimilate to the United States, right? Mm. But I think now there's a greater appreciation for bringing your, your um, authentic self to the workplace and to the work that you do, right? And so I, uh, encouraging students to, you know, whatever that set of values is and the community that they come from, um, to celebrate that and bring it to their work, I think can only benefit them um, mm. and, and for them to be proud of that. That's awesome. That's, a, that's great because one of the things I was thinking about, as you're saying, I, I think a lot about names, right? Mm. Um, especially if you look at my last name, one of the first questions I get in class is, how do we say your last name? You know, and uh, I've adopted a, I've adopted becoming Dr. W because it's just easier to say, right? Um, you know, in terms of that, and that's only my last name, right? So, you know, thinking about things like names and how do we present ourselves, right? Um, as a sociologist, I wanna do a whole paper on, you know, how we present ourselves and who we really are, right? And in, in that, but thinking about how names matter, um, thinking about how their cultural values matter, um, that might not be part of the mainstream culture of where you are, but how can you bring that authentic self um, to work, um, to college, and also how can that benefit organizations as a whole? Yeah, yeah. And, I, I, and I'm so happy to see more of a appreciation for uh, you know, being authentic and bringing your whole self to work and also, you know, different cultures and how we show up in the world. I think that that can, that's really great. One great advancement recently I've seen, uh, I don't know if it's a result of COVID. I don't, I don't know. I just feel like we do, um, there is much more of a focus on being authentic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Angela, thank you so much for your time today and for all the, the wisdom um, that you are sharing with us. I want to op open this up. That, that, those are all my questions and presentation. I do want to open it up for a few minutes. If anybody has any, wow, I didn't even finish the sentence and he put his hand up. Dr. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let me just finish the sentence first. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I want to open it up for a few minutes if we have any questions, comments, additional um, commentary um, while we have Angela. And then before I let you all go, I do have some major announcements for this series. So when we're done with that part, please just hold on for a second so I can provide some updates. So I will now, um, this is Dr. Kanya who I've been mentioning. So I will uh, let him uh, ask this question or provide commentary. <laughs> Angela, I was really intrigued by something that you said in the Greek American community. Culturally, you don't feel American, but you don't feel Greek in a sense, yeah. because culturally you're you're embedded in being Greek American, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I I see that similarity in like the Polish American community and the other communities. Mm -hmm. And for me would would be great in terms of research is what does that mean specifically mm -hmm. so that you know going back to what dr wisniewski said in terms of authentic self right you know what does it truly mean to be greek american mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's so it's so funny you say this because one of my well there's so many things now that you just brought up for me in my thesis a, a big part of it was how we created our own language, our own dialect of Greek, because as Greek kids growing up, there were certain words we just didn't know. So we would sort of take an English word and add a Greek ending to it, right? And so we created our own language. Um, and, and that's just one indication of how we sort of took these two cultures and kind of are trying to, we sort of made it our own. And so if you go to, if I, when I go to Greece, I'm not, in their view, totally Greek. Greek. I'm the American that's saying, but when I'm here, I don't feel like hundred percent American because I grew up in a really Greek household, right? Speaking a different language. And so um, to your point, yeah, it's this very weird borderline state that we live in. And um, I have a really close friend who's in the same situation. She's Italian. Her parents came here from Italy and it's the same experience. And, and that's why I think these conversations are so important because we are all um 
living a very similar existence whether it's Polish, Italian, Greek, whatever that might be, um, uh, of sort of this middle place. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I relate because when I'm in Poland, that I am the American visiting. But yeah. here, my, my cultural upbringing doesn't make me fully, uh, I don't know, I mean, I am fully American, but there's difference of experiences, right, that we relate to when we find others, and uh, I had to giggle when you said about the ending of Greek works, because I'm thinking about trafiku, um, yeah. and yeah. garbage, which are not Polish words, and all it is is śmiecie, which is garbage, right? <laughs> or, you know, garbage, or korek, which is traffic, but yeah. we just, trafiku, yeah. And my first time I went to Poland by myself, everybody around me kind of took me. They're like, these are the words you can't say. They're not going to understand this. Like I had to go through like a, um, I don't know, people were sharing with me, um, you know, what not to do in Poland because of where we live in the middle. Um, and so if you can, uh, Angela, can you give us an example of like, what would, like, I just gave you one for Polish, but what would be like an example in Greek? What would be a Greek ending? for a word sure so like we would say we would say instead of bank we would say banka which is not even the greek word uh, the, the greek word is trapeza but we would make it bank would become banka or car would become caro and you know um to, policemen <laughs> we'd say police manos like police man oh like we would just create these bizarre words right yeah. and they made sense in our family stove became stofa like we would just create these words that made sense in our family but then we'd go to Greece and they'd be like what the heck are you talking about like what is a stofa that is not a stove right um which also you made me think of another thing which was our parents came here right and it was they left their they left their country and so the Greek we were learning we mm. either from our grandparents that were here with them or from like a snapshot in time yeah. of the language in Greece was at the time. And so when we'd go back to Greece, not only did we not know certain words, we had these like bastardized words, we also were speaking like a language of a past generation, right? Like the, the terminology and the idioms and everything was from our grandparents or from our the, the time that our parents left that country. Um, so it was like dated, like we didn't know the current slang. We didn't know, you know, new words. Um, so we have like all of these, we had our own language really, if you think about it. I'll share two quick points to that. One was a recent conversation I had with my spouse who was born and raised in Poland. And I was telling somebody that my Polish is about high school level versus my English is about postgraduate. And I'm trying to make those meet, right? And that's difficult. And his response in the kindest way was, well, you're kind of really like middle school, you know, in Polish, <laughs> right? And I was like, ouch, but like, it was, it was very, you know, productive. It wasn't like, you know, anything else, but the, the reason why we were translating something, right? And then we had a conversation about it because I'm lost between, in gra grammatically, I'm lost between English and Polish, right? I am lost. That is a weakness I have. But then when we talked about it, I'm like, wait a minute, to your point, every Polish speaker is about eighth grade level mm -hmm. that is what I heard growing up right and it's not necessarily they went to college so why would I have a high school or higher equivalent of the language and to something you said also I was listening to a comic and he is his parents are from India but he grew up in Canada and he now goes and does comedy major comedy shows in India and he made a comment that when you grow up in an immigrant community your parent or the parents or whoever left thinks that that country is still where it is at the time that they left. So if they left India in 1970, there's been no progress, right? It's just how they left it is how it is. And when he said that, I'm like, it's the same for us. They still think, you know, it's, it's under a communist rule, right? You know, nothing has changed, right? Um, and I will add here, Isabella said, well, I uh, definitely know the Spanish word for traffic. So is it trafico? Is that, is that where I have correctly? And John adds, how about me? Polish with a Boston accent. Yeah, that, that is a unique. 
as oh. yeah, the accents. Oh, don't. So really, we were just creating our own dialect between our our American accent, depending on what state you were from, the the um, rural sort of like grandparent terminology for certain words. Add in English slash words with Greek endings. Um, so yeah, we were speaking. We thought we were fluent, but and I will say, you know, to your point, Lisa, about the countries in their mind still being stuck the year that they immigrated. For us, the biggest shift in, in my parents' sort of view of, of what was happening in Greece, besides, I mean, traveling there, obviously, but um, there were big gaps of time between the visit visits, mm -hmm. was when we were able to get Greek television streamed here oh, yeah. in the United States, like by a satellite. That was like um, amazing. And we're still obsessed with it. We watch Greek television all the time. My husband mm -hmm. and I have Greek soap operas. I mean, we get a sense of like, what are, what's the fashion over there? What are, what's new? What's interesting? And amazingly, they use English words to describe yeah. certain things. And I'm just like, wow, the influence is just, it's just, we're really, you know, I don't know. It's just amazing. So like there was no word weekend in Polish. There's oh. no word. All right, now it's used. It's just weekend, right? There was no such thing. Um, so which will go to our theme for next year because next year we're going to continue these lectures and our theme is global citizenship so those are kinds of topics we'll explore over the next year um i know we kind of went off on stories or anything does anybody else have a comment or a question or anything i don't want to run out of time i know we got excited and chatted <laughs> about a little different thing so i hope we entertained you for a little bit even oh yeah, yeah. i see andre hello everyone um Thank you, Angela, for a lovely talk. Um, I have I have a question, but I, what I'll do is I've taken your details. If you don't mind, uh, can I email you uh, with the question? Uh, I'm a mature student studying theology, and my next task is to set up a network of bringing the Gospels to millennials. Mm -hmm. And I realize I need uh, a network, uh, uh, you know, the capital. I'm starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't mind picking your brains on, on doing, doing some of those things. Uh, for yes, millennials. I, would love that. I would love that. That sounds so interesting. Please do. I, Please do me. I very much relate to uh, Lisa and, and yourself. Um, my parents came from India and it was the same. They were in that time walk. I've picked up idioms and things from my parents who are past now, but I still hang on to them. And, and my ki kids look at me and say, what are you saying? You know, so I, I think it must be common across the board. It doesn't matter where you come from. If you're, in, if you come into a new culture, uh, it, it must be that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. If you want to stay back for a minute, and we'll provide those details for you so that you can connect. Um, you know, we'll we'll right. hang for a little bit after to make sure you're all connected. Thanks. Hey, okay. uh, Isabella, I would love to sit on a webinar with more first gen children of immigrants and navigating different inter international work and professional cultures. Uh, Isabella, thank you. Yes, and um, we'll, we'll make it happen. How about, is that okay? We're gonna make it happen over the next year. Yes. Um, so if I may just hold you for one moment, I do wanna uh, share some major announcements. Uh, some of you come to every week. Um, so I wanted to share a couple things I've been working on. Um, we have, um, we are gonna continue these conversations over the next year. I can finally announce that we have formally, we're fi formally booked for the whole year. We have speakers lined up through the end of the year through December, um, which was much faster than I thought. I am just sharing, uh, and we are just editing some minor details about that. So I hope that within the next two weeks, if you come to the next session, I can provide all of those details um, for you. Um, so that way you can register, have this on your calendars. Um, as I kind of shared quickly, um, our, into the next year, our theme will be global citizenship. And we're gonna continue um, discussing these types of topics, um, but also taking them a step further, we're gonna have conversations around elections and why they matter. What does that mean to different immigrant communities, but also groups as a whole. And what is our collective responsibility? These are the topics that we're gonna explore over the next year. Um, we already have a wonderful lineup of speakers and I'm just very excited to say I'm booked for the year. Um, so I'm gonna share that. Um, and we will continue this program 
programming into 2023, which we'll, we'll begin working on soon. So I hope to share all those details with you in our next session. Um, I am putting the information for our next session into the chat. It is in two weeks. It is a movie review, and we're going to talk about very um, similar topics. And one more exciting announcement is we are adding one more session this summer. Um, I have received confirmation from our a speaker um, who will be joining us talking about immigration, especially focused on Europe, um, uh, especially with many things that are going on there. And interesting enough, he will be joining us from Europe that day. Um, so we will have one more session that I will send out very soon on July 28th at the same time at 1230. Um, so I can confirm that as well. So I will send out these updates. I thank you all for joining us today. If you have any questions, I always stay back to, to chat for a few minutes um, and to share any rel relevant info. Um, and we will have the recordings available of our past uh, lectures and also Angela's very soon. They will be up on the university's YouTube page. Um, so that way you can share and revisit um, some of the topics that we have have discussed. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for coming. Angela, thank you for sharing um, your expertise. Thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to seeing you all in the next session. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Thanks everyone for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you.